issue number one being happy at Bethel. When speaking to his relatives, he found they were not interested. <laughs> in fact, as long as it wasn't in the Kingdom Hall itself, then he really didn't care. Well, that's reasonable. I mean, you wouldn't want to do something like that in the Kingdom Hall. We're just talking about Jehovah's House. Since the friends have had parties with non-Kingdom melodies uh, all the time, and so it seems uh, reasonable. Well, that's that that may <laughs> that may seem really clucky to you, but I can imagine my own relatives re reasoning out the same uh, uh, thing. That the big thing all the time that my relatives say is, "Well, if the brothers say it's all right, they always refer to the brothers." Because the brothers convened uh, and decided that Happy at Bethel, it's pretty good. Yeah, we could do that in Jehovah's house. Sure. Well, um, I'm just remembering um, a little story here. Uh, I remember that in the 1990s, there was a book study group that um, started having refreshments after the book study. And this was not in the Kingdom Hall. This was when uh, the one-hour book studies on Tuesday nights were held in individuals' homes. People would have it in their living rooms of their house. There would be 20, 25 people there. And they started having uh, a thing where after, after the book study, they would uh, play, play little games and the kids would play games and everyone would bring their friggin' marshmallow... Uh, what is... What was that shit even called? What, the goop. Oh, it's some kind of jello with marshmallows. Well, you get the idea. And people would bring that, and then they'd sit around with little dishes and eat it. Well, um, the circuit overseer came along and put an end to it. Because um, the, the book study is not a time for merriment. Even though this was done after the book study was completed in the people's homes. The circuit, overste the circuit overseer still uh, felt he had the authority, and he certainly did, to end this practice because he felt that it could lead to people looking forward to the book study. <laughs> the people would be looking forward to the book study uh, for the purpose of enjoying the recreation and uh, uh, good feeling afterwards, which is not what they were trying to do there. Minor note, uh, some years later they eventually had to cancel the book studies altogether Jehovah had to cancel his plans to be having book studies because the, they couldn't get attendance above 50%. <laughs> so, Jehovah is... He's going to get people onto the ark, but he can't even get them into a Tuesday night book study. Well, um, I'm also um, remembering a uh, another uh, couple. It was a young couple. Um, that started having a watchtower study in their house. This was in the early 2000s. Um, and this was in preparation for the Sunday meeting, of course. On Friday evenings, they would have a, a group of people over to their home, and they would sit in their living room, enjoy Chex Mix and popcorn, and study and have a group study of the watchtower. And it got to be very popular. To where it got, at first it was like 15, 20 people, got to be 25, 30. Uh, all the young people in the hall wanted to go there because it was this popular young couple. And they were very inclusive. They did, they weren't shutting, it wasn't like a club where they were shutting people out. They they even, they had people a variety of ages there. Um, they even would wheel in an old person <laughs> to be included in it. Because you, you see things like that in the magazines. And so they wanted to have that kind of inclusive recreational thing that was also based in Jehovah. Well, the elders eventually put a stop to that as well. Because, um, and here's what the uh, head of the household, Timothy, told me happened. It was, uh, the elders met about it, and um, without telling these people. They didn't, they didn't tell this young couple that they were meeting about this. They just kind of heard and got the sense of what was going on. In fact, I think one of the elders even showed up for one of these... Uh, uh, watchtower studies, and everyone was probably under the impression that he was having a good time too, but in fact he was gathering uh, info on what was going on there, and then the elders met uh, secretly or privately on their own time about it, and then informed uh, Timothy that the uh, watchtower, the group watchtower study would be discontinued, 
because it was presented thusly. He said, Timothy, uh, you and your wife are spiritually advanced, and we commend you for that. Um, is everyone at the Watchtower study, uh, would you say they're on the same spiritual level as you? Because uh, specifically, and they named names, so-and-so, and also uh, uh, so-and-so, um, they're, they're relatively new to the truth, aren't they? And then so-and-so, they're kind of spiritually weak. Um, if, you, if you were to become unevenly yoked with a person that's more spiritually weak than you, could that person drag you down? Do you think it's a danger for your family that they could be, unintentionally, but people in your group that you're trying to boost and support and encourage spiritually, that you could actually be bringing people down to the lowest level of the lowest person in the group? And so uh, the Watchtower study was disbanded. And um, anyway, well, we've come a long way between then and now. Uh, we are now in the Happy at Bethel era, as you know. And I resisted it for I resisted Happy at Bethel at first. I'm on board now, just so you know. I am. I lost. I tried to fight the war. I lost. So Happy at Bethel wins. Um, issue number two, the Elder Training video. If you may remember it, it was something that was around uh, for a couple of weeks. It was the hot commodity, and then it disappeared pretty fast. Um, I'm still talking about it though, um, but anyway, uh, he he uh, I guess showed the elder training videos to his uh, JW family, and their uh, response was that it's obviously faked. It's not real, and uh, you see his relatives are aware of the exclusive publications that the Watchtower Society makes books and videos, etc., and memos and letters that aren't to be seen by the congregation specifically for the elders or exclusive people, and uh, considered that the elders leak, who, the elders who leak these materials, it keeps happening again and again, are snakes in the grass. They were not prepared to accept the Robbie video as real, since it didn't agree with their view that DFing can only happen if you're unrepentant. And this is key. You see, um, uh, this Robbie video that came out, it was very popular. People watched it, and it was... It was hot stuff for about a week, and then people had a good laugh and forgot about it. I didn't forget about it. Well, anyway, there's this uh, young JW chap uh, named Robbie, and he um, he says that he went to a sandwich shop, got seduced by a woman, and she uh, basically man-raped him. He's a JW man, baby, and he's crying. He's crying to the elders, and he's pleading and begging with them. Because he, he wants to be a, he wants to be a JW. He's not leaving for the world. He wants to stay a JW, but he knows he's really messed up and blown it. But he doesn't want to ruin his JW life. Doesn't want to lose his JW family. Doesn't want to have his JW world ruined. And so he's begging them not to disfellowship him. Well, and at first the elders think about it and they say, Well, you know, Robbie, he's little Robbie from our congregation. And we've been his elders... Ever, probably ever since he was a little boy. We went fishing with him. We watched him grow up. But, uh, in the end, the elders say, well, we can't let Robbie get away with it, though. We can't let Robbie think that he's going to get away with it, you see? And it would be wrong to let Robbie escape without getting what's coming to him. Robbie has to pay the price. And this is an instructional video showing... Reminding elders that uh, all the little Robbies out there need to pay for failing. Um, to me, this is highly significant. And it was very, very, it was eyebrow raising for me because this, this is an actual practical demonstration that, they, that uh, the elders and the Jehovah's Witness organization is, is not a Christian thing to do. Because the whole idea of Christianity is that sinners aren't going to pay by means of Jesus Christ's sacrifice are not going to get what's coming to them. And the whole Jehovah's Witness video is all about making sure every, nobody gets away. Everybody gets what's going to be coming to them. And um, it's, you know, at first you laugh about it and then you start thinking about it and you're like, wait, this is really ugly. 
Because if you're not getting forgiveness, because everybody's sinning, and if you're making a point to bust people, catch people, make people pay the price, well then, what, it's not really Christianity. It's like, what is this? Uh, on the surface, it seems like something very conventional, very Jehovah's Witness, and something you're used to being a Jehovah's Witness. But they, all, they always have that lip service there of saying, oh, we're the most forgiving people on earth. Thousands of people get disfellowship, but it's only because of their own wickedness. They are stubborn. Their stubborn refusal to submit to the elders. And that's what you always hear when you're saying, and you're like, I, I don't, you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness and you're like, I can't get on board with the whole disfellowshipping thing. And they're like, oh, it seems harsh, but really people disfellowship themselves. Because only people who are rebellious and refuse stubbornly to repent get disfellowship. In the video, <laughs> you have this whimpering sap begging, literally begging the elders like their Jehovah God just not to do this to them, and they do it anyway. And um, it's something that at first you're watching it because you're like, oh yeah, that's Jehovah's Witnesses, but then after wait, you're like, you're like, why, wait, why does this religion exist? The sense was that believing in the training uh, video as real would make them accessories to leaking the elder's crime. That's a very Jehovah's Witnessy uh, position to take. It's uh, well, it's all it's all very. It reminds me of my own relatives very much. That if you if you believed that the video was authentic in a way, you'd be complicit with it with the crime of it being leaked. And so they decide in their mind that it, they decide to make it not real and say, "Well, I'm sure that's fake." You can tell they were confused by it since the video contradicted what they were told. I can't emphasize this enough. It is. Um, it's a double speak thing of Jehovah's Witnesses that they're always talking about punishing people, catching people, getting people, and that's their big thing. Well, you watch this. You watch this uh, recent JW Struggle video. A guy used to be an elder. He was like, "Yeah, the the big thing about being an elder for me, I just couldn't do those stakeouts. They were wanting me to do a stakeout. They're living the reality, hearing a different thing with their ears. A lot of cog dissonance." going on. Um, they even considered the possibility that XJWs created the video for mischief. <laughs> Didn't think of that, did you? Did you? Well, you never even considered that. The possibilities that, you know, Tony Prime made this in his basement? Entirely possible. No, I don't think you have to suspend disbelief to go along with that. Didn't even cross your mind, did it? Child abuse. This touched them. Unfortunate choice of words there. What? I wouldn't have typed that. Well, this touched them and rubbed them, but not for the reasons that we would expect. It was uh, because of them being old school. They were of the opinion that discussing a child's complaint with the abuser was a reasonable course of action and legal. Well, you know, just keeping it real. Folks, folks, can we keep it, can we keep it straight? A lot, of the, a lot of these points of views, it's not entirely just about being JW. It's also about being like grandparent age and people are out of touch. Look, there's a lot of, um, a lot of people from the black and white <laughs> generation and years, they, they, um, they don't really see the problem of saying, oh, a child said that they uh, got molested. They probably don't even really think or visualize what molestation means. They probably think it's like sitting on somebody's lap and... Well, it might get a lot more graphic than that. <laughs> but they're under the impression that the elders are handling it. And that's not just a cop-out. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm going to get real with you. Most JWs, they're not trying to do anything wrong, and they don't really think they're doing anything wrong. It has been imprinted into the JW psyche and consciousness through reinforcement meetings every other day day in day out they have the meetings you're like why do they got to go to meetings all the time and why do they get so irritated and uptight when people miss meetings because that is when the mental imprint gets 
reinforced again and again. Trust the elders. Believe in the elders. Even, even the new song book has a song singing about the loyalty of the elders. It, and they emphasize it again and again. When an elder speak, it's like you're listening to Jehovah. It's like you're listening to a CD recorded by Jehovah of his greatest hits. And for this reason, the JW's probably ha average JW probably has too much trust in a uh, elder. Elders are just schmoes. Well, you've been watching the Derek and Leon channel and seeing some of these elders in action. They're jackasses, right? Becomes pretty obvious after a couple minutes. They don't even know what they're doing. Well, um, they are handling child molestation cases now. And it is a... Um, and they're under the impression that... I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and just speak for a lot of JWs there. First of all, they're thinking, okay, yeah, it goes to the back room, but they're probably just sorting things out, and then the police get called. Well, they don't really know what's probably going on, which, uh, you know, they don't, I, they're probably not thinking this all the way through to the end where they say, wait, does the police get called? Uh, well, who knows? You wouldn't stress your brother if you didn't have to. That's another thing that is uh, unique to the Jehovah's Witness thing that is... Um, people, outsiders are always scratching their head because they, they, the, the links that Jehovah's Witnesses will go to to keep everything normalized and not rock the boat in the organization because that's another big thing that's emphasized all the time. Don't make waves in the organization. You wouldn't want to stress Jehovah out, would you? You wouldn't want to stress the brothers that are working so hard. Jehovah appointed those brothers. They considered child abuse as a sin rather than a crime. I advise them to keep that attitude to themselves in the world or risk appearing as monsters. <laughs> they were of the opinion that... <coughs> oh, God, Jesus. I'm sorry, folks. I don't know why I always do that. They were of the opinion that if I didn't see it, it's not my problem. Also, a learned behavior from the Kingdom Hall. If something uh, is confidential, that's a word they use a lot. That's confidential, brother. You're not sticking your nose in where it doesn't belong, are you? You're not trying to get into Jehovah's business, are you? And Jehovah will sort it out, which is another thing you will hear again and again in the Kingdom Hall. Jehovah will fix that in his own time. Except for when it has to do with you. When the elders knock on your door or want to see you in the back room because they say, well... So-and-so told us that this happened, and you say, Well, uh, I guess, could we let Jehovah sort it out? No, we'll sort it out right now. And you say, well, I just kind of prefer to let Jehovah handle it this time. Since Jehovah's hands are so much bigger than ours. Can we leave the matter in Jehovah's hands? All right, we will. And that's how it, what? That's what they say at the end of that conversation. But, what got their attention, <laughs> what's going on with me, <laughs> I'm just a, I'm just like a big bag of slime, aren't I, <laughs> you, um, you, um, I'm just like a big bag of spaghetti sauce, if you've never met me, but, what got their attention was that the cult had a database, withheld it from Cedars, he's talking about the 20,000 pedophile, <laughs> database of Jehovah's Witnesses. I'll tell you about it sometime. When he requested it and that donations were being used to pay hush money and non-appearance fines. Well, here's the thing. Apparently there's this uh, computer program with a... It has been leaked uh, to the general public that apparently the Watchtower Society has a computer full of 20 plus thousand names of people that are JWs that are probably pedophiles. But they're not sharing that uh, database. They say, well, we're going to keep this secret and we'll keep it to ourselves. Here's the thing, though. That sounds really awful. I mean, this sounds like the biggest scandal of the history of the religion, right? Well, it's not. Huh? Because. It's, it's almost like a worthless piece of information. Because. You can't convince any Jehovah's Witness that it exists. 
Uh, they may nod their head when they're talking to you. They don't believe you. It's too good. It sounds like a lie Satan created. No, no, stop. Stop. Satan, he's trying to unravel Jehovah's organization, right? He's trying to discourage Jehovah's Witnesses and cause them to lose out in the race for life. Correct? Well, what better lie than this? It's too juicy. It's too big. It's too outrageous. And that's the great irony. This incredible blunder by the Jehovah's Witness or this incredible thing that's outrageously wrong, it doesn't even matter because it's something, yes, it was something that would horrify a person. And that's how they know it's a lie. So you got to walk away. Hey, the United Nations uh, scandal too. This is stuff I got to tell you. The United Nations uh, scandal. This is something that officially should end the religion. We're talking about the end of the Jehovah's Witness religion. Jehovah's organization signing up to be in the United Nations. This is the bell of death. This is where people walk away from the religion. It's over. But... It's, a re it's, it's of no consequence because there's no way you can make anyone in the kingdom all believe it. It's like it didn't happen. It might as well not have happened because the people in the kingdom hall are not going to believe you because it's so obviously a lie of Satan's. It's propaganda. Or maybe the United Nations is even complicit in it, making up this lie to make Jehovah's people look bad. Or maybe apostates created themselves. What the Jehovah's Witness at the kingdom hall knows is that it's not true. It's like being on Jehovah's battlefield if you're an apostate and somebody handed you a 50 cal machine gun or a rocket launcher. You have this big rocket launcher pointed at Jehovah, Jehovah's organization and you say, I can't use it. It's not going to work. So Jehovah wins again. And well, we just keep losing, don't we folks? <laughs> the great irony is that we keep getting these gifts horse. Oh, we owe uh, we, the people who hate uh, Jehovah's Organization. We keep getting these gems they offer as gifts to us. And, well, oh, it's like being the wicked man that uh, Jehovah got to curse. He was going to curse Jehovah's people, and instead, um, his donkey talked to him and made him bless Jehovah's people three times. It's what keeps happening to me and all the other satanic people. Jehovah keeps winning. How does he do it? He's a master. He's a genius, isn't he? He's a genius! Keeps winning. Keeps molesting. Issue number four, blood. They almost supported the idea that children shouldn't be allowed to dictate their medical attention. And that parents may not always be the best people to decide either. Well, here's, here's the thing in Jehovah's world. They're always talking about children that uh, take a stand for Jehovah and they choose to end their lives instead of accepting blood transfusion. Um, and I'm like, wait, these are the same kids that get whipped at the Kingdom Hall? How is it? We're talking about kids, right? Well, they can't even decide what they'll have for dinner. Kids don't even get to pick what time they go to bed or what clothes they're going to wear to school but they can pick to end their own life? Uh, huh, 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 well. Um, and they have, the, they have the Awake magazine cover where they had all these faces of kids that chose to suicide for Jehovah. And I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, but um, if there's, here, here's my problem. Statistically, and you know this from the Pew Research Foundation that did a comprehensive study Two out of three kids that are raised Jehovah's Witnesses decide to be worldly people when they grow up, right? How many kids were in that Awake magazine from 1994? Where, what did it have, like two dozen kids on the cover that suicided for Jehovah? Or their parents helped them uh, decide to uh, pull the plug? Well, two-thirds of them were going to grow up to be worldly or disfellowshipped or inactive, right? Two-thirds of them were going to apostatize or get disfellowshipped or drop out, right? So, essentially, Jehovah killed... Jehovah killed a bunch of worldly people, or future worldly people. That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> That's... Well... It... Well...
At least because they died when they were kids, they'll be in the new system now. And here's talking about Jehovah's Witnesses being monsters. I gotta break this down for you. And if you're an outsider, you're like, that's just awful. Calm down. Let me explain something to you. Jehovah's Witnesses are um resurrecting people. They're giving people eternal life. Now you in Christendom, you go to church, right? One hour on Sunday, you go to a church and you sit there, and they talk about angels sitting in heaven playing harps, and then you, and you nod your head, and then you walk out, and you're back into the real world. That's a second reality. It's not even a second reality to you. It's just fanciful, we wish, what if things, right? When you're thinking about Jesus and the angels floating on pink, pink clouds, that ain't a real thing to you. Or maybe it's pseudo... Uh, I, I don't even know what goes on in, in you people's minds. Let me tell you something about Jehovah's Witnesses. When they come to your door and they sit down with you on your couch and they're talking about the new system, they're not talking about something fanciful. They're not talking about, oh, wouldn't that be nice? They're talking about an actuating reality soon to be here, two to three years. When they're talking about people being resurrected, they're talking about people they know, and they're making plans to see them very soon. I've known Jehovah's Witnesses that have their relatives' rooms ready for the upcoming resurrection. Killing people. They're saving people's lives. Especially since um, the dropout rate of Jehovah's Witnesses is getting worse all the time. When, um, when, people, when people die young and they're, they've been Jehovah's Witnesses, it's almost like they averted, you know, an uncertain outcome. That sounds, that sounds, <coughs> that sounds, that sounds. <laughs> well, um, long story short, um, Look, if you think somebody's going to get resurrected, it's not like a big deal. <laughs> I don't know how to... Um, you have to be there. You have to be there to understand. But um, first of all, you're like, blood. people die in blood transfusion. It doesn't even happen that often. And when it does, they're just going to get resurrected. It's been guaranteed. Whereas the average Jehovah's Witness has no actual guarantee that they're going to uh, make it in the due system. That's an iffy thing. Um... Anyway, JWs are a hierarchy. Yeah, right. That is something that will anger a Jehovah's Witness quicker than anything else. You suggest that their organization is a hierarchy? Damn. They totally refuse to accept this. It angered them, in fact. Hierarchies are a Catholic thing. But the governing body and the circuit overseers are serving us. They're the slaves, we're the publishers, right? <laughs> um, well, they like to think of it as an inverted pyramid, with them at the top and the GB at the bottom. No, 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 he, whoa, 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 sit down. He's not kidding. That's the way Jehovah's Witnesses really, I know, it's, it's, you're saying, I can't believe that. That's just silly. Well, I don't know what to tell you because that is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They believe that the governing body are beneath them and working for them and serving them in a way by facilitating. They work so hard from... They, they get up at 6 a.m. in the morning and just work their guts out all day with what little resources they have. They scrape together every little penny to make it possible for Jehovah's servants to... Uh, um, they give them that access to make serving Jehovah possible. They're just facilitating it. Um, they refused to accept that the elders, etc., dispensed life and must be obeyed. Again, more cognitive dissonance. A Jehovah's Witness actually knows that their life depends on obeying the elders, but if you suggest it back to them, if you tell, if you, if you tell back to them the things they're telling to you, they deny it. Oh no, we're all equals. We just have different assignments. But all of us are equals, even the governing body. 
We're a society of equals. <laughs> they were so stubborn on this, they were prepared to accept that DFing can be an error and didn't need to be strictly adhered to because Jay would sort it out. Well, he gets back. See, that's the thing. They always say Jay's going to sort it out, but he doesn't. That's the other thing. I wouldn't even be complaining if Jay did sort things out. I'd be happy to leave matters in Jay's hand. He doesn't do anything. Pinky rings and Rolexes. Got heated at this idea. I already know what he's going to say before he even writes it. The pinky rings and the Rolexes. I knew the moment that got brought up, the, 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 the roof would blow off. Well, things got heated at the idea that they were perks of the job. They absolutely insisted the jewelry was personally paid for. How? Stop. And I know that you may be prepared to believe this also. You say, well, maybe they use their own money to pay for it. No way. If you're, Je if you're somebody that is actually a Jehovah's Witness, you're like, you, can see, you nod your head for two seconds and you say, no, wait, no. That's impossible. What you're talking about is impossible. Because Jehovah's Witnesses don't have any money, right? Or you're not, if, you're, if you've lived a life that would uh, supposedly lead you to become a member of the governing body, excuse me, supposedly, the idea is that governing body members used to be special pioneers or circuit overseers, or that originally they were people that, the idea is that you abandon the things of this world and you devote yourself so earnestly to the ministry and the service of Jehovah that you're not a person that's going to be profiting from this world. If you're, if you're doing things the way that Watchtower Magazine, if you're going paint by numbers of Watchtower Magazine, you shouldn't have two pennies to rub together, right? Because you cast off every weight, you use every resource of this wicked old system of things to uh, support and pay for your ministry. You're going to tell me that 30 years later, after living this, li this austere lifestyle of uh, self-sacrifice and personal denial, that somehow you made it all the way, you, you made it all the way to being a circuit overseer, which you don't, you supposedly don't get money for that, wink. Um, you, you were a circuit overseer living, eating like a bird, living like a vagabond, uh, just sleeping on people's couches. Come on. And then you got, and then you got promoted to working at Bethel or something where you take a vow of poverty. Wait, there's just no, there's no realistic, uh, order of events that would lead you to being a member of the governing body. Well, say, oh, well, I'm here. I'm a member of the governing body now. I lived a life of self-sacrifice, but it was worth it. Well, first order of business, I'll use my huge savings account to buy myself a $20,000 Rolex. Get real. The fact that they all have chosen the same watch didn't even shift them. Now see, that is... Mm, who bought these watches for them? And you say, oh, well, it must, have been, it must have been a real big fan of Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, it must have been a, uh, must have been a wealthy Jehovah's Witness that bought these for them. Huh? Wait, if you're, no, let me get this straight. If, in your, if you're in the mind frame of serving Jehovah, and through any order of events, you came to acquire a Rolex watch, would you not sell that watch and buy a service car? Even if you don't need a service car because you're on the governing body and you don't go out in service anymore, wouldn't you buy someone you know that needs a service car a service car? These matching watches... Who bought them? That's scary. Who 
once once you start uh, reducing and and doing the process of deduction on this, and you say, who did they make so much money for, or who profited so much from the existence of this Jehovah's Witness governing body panel, that they just wanted to give them a small token of their appreciation, and dropped a hundred grand on buying them watches. That's scary. Who profits so much from the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses that they decided to give them all club rings to wear on their pinkies? That's something to think about. The pyramid of Jehovah's Witnesses, the organizational structure. Does it ever even occur to you that the people at the top aren't even Jehovah's Witnesses? The people at the top of Jehovah's organization aren't worshipers of Jehovah. Just kidding. I'm just making stuff up. It couldn't be from donations. And aside from that, they can be as flashy if they want to. Well, that's something you hear a lot too, that it doesn't match up with anything Jehovah's Witnesses say Monday through Sunday. does They're not practicing what they preach, are they? Look, you can't be wearing a Rolex watch and then tell and then tell us that you're giving talks about uh, uh, not going into Satan's world, resisting the things of this world, hating the things of this world. No, you can't do that with a Rolex on. But Jehovah's Witnesses will fall back, and they and they you tell them that you want a job promotion or you want to go to college, they'll give you a big speech and a big come on about rejecting Satan's world. The love of money. The love of Satan's world. Then you got the leaders wearing gold watches. And then they and then so they have to fall in line and they say, Well, it's alright. The Roman soldiers gambled over Jesus' clothing. That must have mean it had value. It must have been a fine garment that Jesus was wearing. Yeah, because gamblers are really rational. <laughs> because gamblers need something to gamble over. Well, that's how we know that Jesus also wore a Rolex. Oh, I mean a, uh, uh, the, uh, he had a, uh, uh, he had a future time watch on his hand. Well, he, maybe they were a gift from Jesus. Maybe Jesus... Because they're getting messages in their mind all the time, right? Because they have that Holy Spirit communicating with them. What if, Jeho what if Jehovah and Jesus just sent them a message into their mind and say, Good work, guys. Give yourselves a big... Go out and buy a big present for yourselves because you deserve it. And they said, Oh, we have that new light, the Jehovah and Jesus. How can I tell one false prophet from another? An example, uh, the preacher camping from 2011... Who set a date certain for the end of the world? And, um, well, spoiler alert, um, the Armageddon date uh, turned out to technically not come true. But, huh, and it, rem it reminded people of Jehovah's Witnesses. And people didn't believe it when, when uh, the family radio people were, then they put up billboards and they were on TV talking about the end of the world. And they, it reminded people of Jehovah's Witnesses because of the certainty that these people spoke with. The same way the Jehovah's Witnesses said that this generation will by no means pass away. It was that same air of certainty. And so when the family radio people were doing their preaching campaign, and their witnessing work, um, it reminded people of Jehovah's Witnesses and they said, well, we've seen this movie before, not going to fall for it. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses are not bothered by that though. And people that draw comparisons, well, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't aren't bothered by that because they say it's entirely different because camping did not use God's name. Those weren't God's chosen people. That was a, something from Christendom. So what does it have to do with us? We're God's favored people. And even, even when our human leaders, being imperfect men, even when they make mistakes or take missteps, it's still Jehovah's only organization. Who else is God working through? Who else is using the divine name Jehovah? 
Who else goes door to door? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the uh, the guy the guy from Christendom who predicted the end of the world. Well, that was his own arrogance and his own darkness and his own blindness. But Jehovah's Witnesses are an enlightened people using God's name, and sometimes in their zealousness to see Jehovah's prophecies come true, sometimes there will be that genuine misunderstanding of running ahead of Jehovah a little bit and just being over-anxious to see his name vindicated in the new system come. So you have that honest-hearted, genuine mistake of expecting the end of the world too soon, or the end of this system of things. And, well, well, this part gets crazy here. <laughs> and that God changes the message to be consistent with the organization. Now that is, well, now that I'm thinking about it, it makes sense. Sometimes God changes his plans to fit the Jehovah's Witnesses' plans. Huh? Oh, I mean, yeah! Um, current level, to, uh, to fit with their current level of understanding, also known as old light and new light. So, effective, see, Jehovah understands that his people are sheep-like and not ready to, you know, grasp the full meaning of things. So, he has that progressive light where he, he drips. He drips little bits of light over a period of a hundred years, 120, 140. So effectively, the big day was coming when the GB said, but J extended the date and advised the change to the GB. Well, and I believe my friend's relatives told him this, but um, I don't. I don't think that's actually uh, correct. Um, it sounds like something a crazy JW housewife would say, or maybe a crazy pioneer sister. But and you can't look. You can't blame them. Um, there, it's like Jehovah's Witnesses. It's like they're always dealing you cards, and then after they deal the cards to you, they take cards out of your hands and put different ones in there. And you're trying. And you're trying to play their game. You're trying to play their game, and they keep switching the cards on you. Well, um, the idea here is that. Um, that the, the Armageddon date was set, but then for whatever reason, Jehovah said, well, I'll decide to extend a little bit. And I think that actually has some scriptural um, basis there where Jehovah is always extending a little bit further than he should because of he's so merciful. And he just doesn't want all those good buildings to have to fall on people. Those buildings have a lot of bricks in them. I could use. Jehovah's Witnesses' famous thing is the 1975 date for uh, the end of this system of things and the beginning of the uh, new system of things. The math was dead on. It was perfect. And that's what I think people can't get over is that's when it should have happened. It would have been so perfect. It's like the stars were aligned. The, the history of Jehovah's Witnesses, it was like everything was falling into place and turning out just as it should. And, well, again, this is all before I was born, but in, in retro, I can, I'm looking back and I'm seeing how people were looking and thinking at the time. It just, they even, even after the date came and went and it didn't happen, it's still people... It just wanted it so bad, they're acting like it almost did happen. <laughs> I don't know. Um, the 1980s, uh, well, they pushed it back and said, well, 1984. 1984 to 1994, because in the Bible it said that the length of a man's years is 70 or 80 years. And they said, 1914, the generation is going to last 70 or 80 years. And 19, the 1980s, early 1990s, there was, I don't even know how to describe it to you. Uh, if you weren't in the world of Jehovah's Witnesses in this time, there was an electricity in the air. There was the Cold War going on. There was the maximizing of the preaching work. The Watchtower and Awake magazines went from being black and white uh, pulp newspaper to being these color magazines. And the covers... Oh, the covers of these magazines. Crack cocaine. The AIDS epidemic. Runaway children. White slavery. <laughs> I don't know. They had a different... 
They had a different one each month. They had two a month. And it was, it seemed like Armageddon was, it was like a bubbling teapot <laughs> in Jehovah's Kitchen. And um, it's a different feeling now. It's th That time is gone. It just dissipated. Nothing even happened. It just fizzled, you know? That 20th century air of certainty that Armageddon was in its trembling final moments... That feeling just, it's like the air went out of the tires and it's gone. And what's left now is barely recognizable to someone like me. A bland, you know, vanilla yogurt world of the, the JW.org, I guess people like it. To me, it's like they're giving up. I, you know, this is this isn't how I saw the future. This isn't what I thought it would be. The 1980s and 90s. It seems it seemed like there was this monumental World War III Lawrence of Arabia story that was unfolding, and we were all part of it. And it and it was just this epic thing that was uh, about to be realized. You were in the final moments before its full realization, and then it wasn't even like it. It wasn't even like a halfway thing. Just nothing happened. And now it's years later, it's decades later, and the people that you're originally the governing body, it was it was a thing where you believe it. You believe it because it's it's just that sure it's coming now. It's like people the belief is there but the credibility isn't there. And that's what's amazing to me is that in the old days it was like, well, we have no reason to doubt the governing body. And now, the, all these decades later, it's like, wait, you have no reason to believe the governing body. Because nothing came true. JW.org, it's great! Here I'm clapping! I'm clapping, it's wonderful! I'm so happy for you! This wasn't predicted. This isn't what's supposed to be happening. Armageddon has been pushed so far back into people's minds. I'm watching the Derek and Leon videos of people on their channel. They had this ass hat standing out there holding his cell phone, recording Derek on his, and he's standing there talking with his bull horn and recording and everything. The guy is standing there for 15 minutes holding his little phone, camera phone out and recording him and then he goes and he stands by a wall and then he meanders around a little bit and then he's standing by a fence and looking around like he's an animal. Like he's a guinea pig walking around in his cage or something. Is the end of the world even in these people's minds anymore? What's going on? The loyalty and obedience and self-sacrifice what hasn't changed about Jehovah's Witnesses is that they're still ready, willing, and able to throw themselves on their own swords. Or, or more and more, it's getting to be uh, taking somebody's uh, protest sign and trying to impale them with it. <laughs> or what? They're willing to. They're willing to do all these things for JW.org, for the organization, for the governing body. But the they're not even worried about the fulfillment of the promises anymore. It's just like. It's just like that baseline of loyalty is still there, but it isn't earned. Cuz they cuz they used to be playing <clears throat> it used to be like they were they were playing with an IOU or something. And all but it's like the ex expiration date on all the coupons is done. And they're still playing with house money and it's like how is this even working anymore? Well, whatever. I'm I'm also coming if I sound if I sound uh deflated myself it's cuz I it's like it's like well a, after a while you see that even when you're winning you're not even winning because when you when you're just dealing with it's like ha ha ha, ha. you got busted for being liars and it's like yeah but we're still going to win so it doesn't matter Enjoy not being at your family's funerals cuz you're not allowed there Can't beat City Hall. Issue number nine, Jehovah is a false name. They knew it and didn't care.
Jay will sort it out after Doomsday. This is amazing. I want you to take a moment to contemplate this. If you're an outsider, or if you're somebody that grew up in the Kingdom Hall environment, well, in the old days, nobody knew or realized that Jehovah isn't actually Jehovah's name. Nobody, nobody was aware of that, and in fact, they were very proud of the fact that they had figured out Jehovah's actual name that was a secret from the rest of the world. And nobody knew, well, it's in the King James Bible, <coughs> but it's still like a secret thing. Now, a lot of years have passed. Um, there's a lot of information that has changed hands, and now Jehovah's Witnesses are starting to accept and realize and even admit, well, Jehovah's not actually... It, it's not actually the Tetragrammaton of, well, look, there's only, the letter H is the only common link between that and what may have been a God's name at some point. I don't know. H is the only letter that may have survived or, or been, or, or survived the eons and that we're using now. The letter H. Um, they know that it's not, whatever Jehovah's name is, it isn't Jehovah. But, they know and don't care because Jehovah will tell him what his name actually is at some point in the future, if he's, when he's ready. Well, it's, a, it's an incredible amount of circular reasoning considering that they, uh, they base the validity of all their claims on the fact that they are the only people that use Jehovah's name. And then you say, yeah, but it can't be Jehovah's name because it isn't Jehovah's name and there isn't a Jehovah because the name was made up. And they say, well, Jehovah, it's the commonly used version of Jehovah. And so we will learn his new name someday when, or I mean his old name at some point when the new scrolls are opened up. And it's like, yeah, but I thought the whole big thing, look, like we talked about before, it doesn't matter how many things go wrong, how many things go haywire, whatever horrible thing you hear about Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever embarrassing, disastrous things happen, Jehovah's Witnesses maintain it doesn't matter because they're still the only people that use the divine name. And then you say, but there, it's, there really isn't a divine name and that certainly isn't it. And they say, well, it's close enough. And Jehovah knows that we try. Jehovah sees that we're trying and it's like, yeah, but you're not hearing me. There is no Jehovah because there's no such thing as a Jehovah. Jehovah is a made up word. It's like, well, it's closer than anything else. Um, <laughs> they, they say, well, Sort it out after doomsday. Issue number 10. Protesters at meetings. This was interesting. Follow me here. <coughs> they invited pro protesters as evidence of persecution. <laughs> Just like we told you. Evidence of pre pro persecution and therefore being correct. No shit. I, I, I've, I'm, I find it amazing how many people say, huh, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't going to listen to you because they just view it as persecution. Oh, really? That had never crossed my mind. I wasn't aware that Jehovah's Witnesses find everything to be persecution. That's such breaking news to me. Thank you for that. Um, and therefore, you're only confirming them as being correct. Ah, <sighs> I guess my plan backfired. Well, thank you for that revelation. I was totally unaware of it and it didn't cross my mind. But, here we go. They hated the idea of protesters being seen to do more to protect children than they do. Bingo. That's all you gotta know. That's all you gotta read right there. That is exactly what I'm talking about. It, it, and they're starting to crack under this pressure. From day one, this is exactly what I said would happen. Exactly! Boy, you want to talk about people predicting the future? Governing body, there's zero for a hundred. How do I keep doing it? How do I keep predicting the future accurately? Years ago, I told you exactly that this would happen. I'd say that people were going to be protesting and giving Jehovah's Witnesses a hard time getting in their face, calling them to the carpet, be it... In front of the Kingdom Hall, be it in the being it in somebody's living room, being it outside the Kingdom Hall, be it on the internet. Jehovah's Witnesses would be called out and that they would say, You are persecuting us. 
just as it is written. And then they would start cracking because you're talking about child molestation. Here's the other thing I got to tell you. These people, bless your hearts, people that I see standing outside of conventions and they're holding up some sign that says John 814 or something. You've lost. You lost before you even got started. And I'm not I'm not disparaging your mainstream Christianity. I'm not poo-pooing your beliefs. Your beliefs are special and beautiful to me. Mwah. But I'm telling you, you lost you lost before you even walked out the door. Because debating debating doctrine and scriptures, Jehovah's Witnesses, it's lose-lose. It's always going to be lose-lose. Because they don't play that game. People holding up signs talking about the two-witness rule. Derek and Leon are winning the game. You want to talk about people that are winning. Derek O'Hare, is he's nailing it. This guy's the champ, man. People grabbing bullhorns, smacking shit out of people's hands, choking them, slamming them against gates, kicking signs, breaking signs, setting signs on fire. Excuse me, is this Jehovah's Witness behavior? Is this stuff they usually do? This guy shows up for five minutes and they set fire to things. As you know, there's uh, uh, very famously a divide between uh, current Jehovah's Witnesses and former Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't exchange words very often, or they're not supposed to. And so, and uh, many JWs are very camera shy. They don't hop onto too many, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not every day you get a direct window into the current thinking of a Jehovah's Witness, because they kind of have their own bubble world. And even though they engage with the general public, it's different. <laughs> That's different. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but the, the presentations at doors are not actually what's going on in the Jehovah's Witness mind. That's a presentation which is not exactly the same as a candid conversation with one of their relatives. Well, uh, uh, second part, uh, issue number one, JWs by definition cannot persecute others because they are right and whatever they want to do in Jay's name should be allowed. And this is very true. Um, it is one exam the extreme example of this would be theocratic warfare strategy, which you may have heard of. Um, that's on the extreme end of things that uh, most rank and file don't get involved in uh, overtly, but it's it's that it's the basic idea and that's and that's the most uh, hardcore example of it is that we do if it's done in Jehovah's name, it can't be wrong. And because we're Jehovah's people, what we're doing can't be wrong. So whatever is, um, whatever has to be done, the ends will justify the means. And that's something Jehovah's Witnesses believe in firmly. If Jehovah benefits or profits by what you're doing, well, it can't be a sin, can it? And uh, again, the extreme example of that would be lying in court. Probably the most famous examples is... Uh, divorce proceedings or child custody. That's when Jehovah's Witnesses really shine when they get up there and lie. Lie for Jehovah. And they will tell all sorts of lies. By the way, Jehovah's Witnesses lying, it doesn't shock or surprise me. I've seen a lifetime of lying for Jehovah. Um, I know all about it. So that is very true. And um, it's, just, it's just a rare treat to see you know, to, um, to see this account of Jehovah's Witness just coming out and say it, um, they, uh, they say, well, we're, when we do some worldly people persecute us, but when we do stuff to them, it's different because we're Jehovah's Witnesses. I call it the license, the licensing from Jehovah to do whatever you have to do. And this is, um, I've seen Jehovah's Witnesses go through other people's purses. <laughs> what? I have. I remember out in service, people going through another sister's purse because they suspected her a little bit. You know, just looking for her secret boyfriend's phone number. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses letting themselves into other people's houses. You know, to check up on things. I, I, I'd be out in service and Jehovah's Witness would go to someone's back door. You know, it's a, well, it's my study. Uh, I'll pull on the door, see if it's open here. Uh, I might even need to let myself in. Uh, you know, just to 
It's, <laughs> I could tell you more stories, you probably wouldn't even believe them. Um, uh, issue number two, the million other religions are wrong. There is uh, a million other religions on the planet, and guess what? They're all wrong. Not just a little bit wrong, they're all completely wrong. And if a person doesn't agree with JWs, they are wrong, and indeed mentally unwell, but not mentally diseased. That's another caveat, that uh, people in Christendom, no matter how backwards they are in their Christendom ways, they're not the mentally diseased. The mentally diseased are specifically former Jehovah's Witnesses who uh, openly vocalize about their Jehovah's Witness past. Well, that's mentally diseased. If you're a former Jehovah's Witness and you don't agree Here's the qualifications to being mentally diseased. You're a former Jehovah's Witness. You don't agree with the uh, teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses anymore. And thirdly, you tell people about it. Boom. Mentally diseased. Uh, also, in, in uh, the rare instance of people in the world who directly work for Satan are also mentally diseased because they're Satan's puppets just like the apostates. And that would be somebody from Church of Satan... People that are, you know, uh, um, satanic worshipers would also be in the mental... But that's my understanding. Are also, because they're working hand-in-hand hand with the apostates, of uh, trying to cheat people out of that eternal life. Um, we just want people to die. People are... Uh, people don't agree only because they can't understand what Jay is saying. Rather than there being a reasonable reason to disagree. Very... I'm glad I'm glad he included this. Um, first, well, there's a lot here, but first of all, the the million other religions that are wrong, and I've, you can have this conversation with a Jehovah's Witness and verify it for yourself. You say, you you could you could pose this hypothetical to them and say, well, what if somebody is technically a you know a mainstream Christian in Christendom, but just by coincidence they believe everything Jehovah's Witnesses believe. You ever think about that? Like, what if, um, what if a church started down the street? What if somebody started up a church and just by sheer coincidence, they believe everything? They be they use the divine name Jehovah. They believe in preaching door to door. Uh, they they don't accept blood transfusions. They don't celebrate birthdays. They nail it just for whatever reason. Well, they would still be wrong, just because they're not. Uh, they're not Jehovah's chosen people. And that goes back to, you're like, yeah, but if they're using the divine name, that's why Jehovah's Witnesses are, well, it's a chicken and an egg thing. A Jehovah's Witness will get real with you. And you're like, come on, it, not everybody at the door is wicked, but everybody slams the door on you. And they say, well, they just don't understand. And it's a shame. You know, and the, it's, it's something tragic a little bit. You know, they're not going to get misty eyed or anything, but they'll say it is unfortunate that if people could just understand what Jehovah's trying to tell them, they wouldn't have to die. But but then that almost feels wrong. You know, when you start thinking about it, it's like, yeah, but why should people have to die just because the whole Jehovah's Witness thing isn't believable at first glance? See, because that's the problem at the door. You have that 30 to 60 to 90 seconds to make a presentation, which, by the way, I hate to bring this up, but have you ever noticed that the presentations at doors... There, there, there's nothing in there that's going to save anyone's life. The, I, I think, I think we, we've abstracted to where it's lost all meaning almost because the idea is that Jehovah's Witnesses are going door to door warning people about Armageddon, giving them the good news of the new system, and all. But the thing is, it never even makes it that far. Hardly ever. You, you really only have that thirty to sixty second window, and it's always talking about the Awake magazine, and it's like. And, it, and it's always stuff like, oh, our environment, can it be cleaner? It, it'd be some topic of the month that's on the cover of the Awaker Watchtower magazine. It's like, yeah, but that really doesn't hit home. And you start to wonder, is the Watchtower Society really trying to save people? <laughs> well, or condemn them? Eh, well, I don't know. It seems almost like you made, you made a half-measured effort to save people, and then you write them off a little bit too quickly. Well... A Jehovah's Witness, off the record, when they are just getting real with you in the comfort of their own home, they say, well, 
Worldly people are basically the same as everyone else. They're not really that wicked, especially since most of them are in Christendom, which is not... I mean, it's like Jehovah's... Well, Christendom's like Jehovah's Witnesses. You're sp they tell you to do good things, not bad. It's all from the... It's like in the Bible, right? It's the same general idea. Maybe they don't... Maybe they're not as... They don't have the stick to itiveness and they say, well, the, the, the unfortunate part is that they still have to die because they, they just can't understand what Jehovah is trying to do here. And realistically, they're not going to jump on board. It's the same as Noah's Ark that just, you know, you're like, you really think they're, they're going to climb into a dark, <laughs> dank box with no air conditioning with a hundred year old man? Come on. Well, they had to die because they just weren't going to do that. It just wasn't going to happen. It's kind of same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses, and and you know, the more self the more self aware Jehovah's Witnesses will realize that too. That I remember when I was Jehovah's Witness, I'd be standing at the door and be like, "This person's gonna think I'm crazy." <laughs> Is that people, Jehovah? It's like it's like ah shucks, I just couldn't get the worldly people to believe what I was going to say. Well, I have to die now. That's too bad. And it's like yeah, but it seems like it could be done better though. And, um, there, and, and, uh, anyway, I think this goes into the, uh, point, point three here where it says, um, his, his relatives say, Jehovah doesn't really kill people, you see, nor does he want to, but there is no other option. When I suggested an option, I'm told that I shouldn't tell Jay what to do. <laughs> I had a curiosity about me, about how Jehovah's, what, what, like, Jehovah's Witnesses, how, how does the outside world perceive it? Um, I remember that on, uh, the big thing was that on sitcoms, like on, you know, Who's the Boss, The Cosby Show, or whatever, kind of a, kind of a repeating gag in the 1980s was, it, it was a door gag. Any, th any part of the story that would include a doorbell or somebody showing up un unsuspectedly, they'd insert, the writers at that time would insert a Jehovah's Witness joke. And it would get a big laugh because uh, most people had had an, an encounter with, oh, somebody showed up out of nowhere and rang the doorbell. Who, oh, it's just Jehovah's Witnesses, and they slammed the door. And I remember at the Kingdom Hall, uh, the, the people in the congregation, like the night before, if it had been on some sitcom that there was a Jehovah's Witness that showed up in the middle of the show, and people laughed, they'd say, they'd say well, <laughs> that just shows that Jehovah's work is getting accomplished. And people know who we are and what we're doing. And that piqued my curiosity in a way of saying, of, because I, like at school or any, in any other uh, avenue of daily life and society, Jehovah's Witnesses are not, there's not even a breath mentioned. The name is not even breathed by anyone. I, and I struggled with this, even at a young age. I, I struggled with this in my in my late grade school, early junior high years that I really wanted to comprehend what is the um, what it, what is the actual view the world of, has of Jehovah's Witnesses because um, on, on the sitcoms when Jehovah's Witnesses were referenced, it just it, it almost just seems a circumstantial thing. It wasn't like they were you know trying to point a finger at Jehovah's Witnesses and I couldn't tell is this you know is this just in a fun spirit like, do they, it's like, it's like, well, <laughs> they, they take note that we really do persevere in our work of going door to door. And I was like, well, do they admire that about Jehovah's Witnesses? Or is it something that they genuinely are annoyed by and they have a contempt for? And I, I wasn't clear on that. And I remember that I went to the uh, public library uh, during the, uh, it would have been summertime of my sixth grade years. I went to the public library one day and I decided that I was going to look up Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and uh, this is, by the way, this is a municipal library, two stories full of books. Um, and they had, the, uh, they had the computer system there where you could type in a topic and it would give you the books to read. Well, I typed in Jehovah's Witnesses and nothing came up. Now bear in mind, at the Kingdom Hall, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that they are the biggest event that is happening at the climax of human history. The preaching campaign of Jehovah's Witnesses is the biggest, most important thing that has ever happened on earth. Uh, in Revelation, they're talking about trumpet blasts, portents being pulled, poured out, 
onto the sea and to the earth, and and the sea rejects its dead, and and uh, the you know <laughs> it's very visual, very descriptive. I mean, it's it's like locusts being unleashed, and they have the pictures of a swarm of locusts coming out of the clouds, and 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 the the uh, the the clergy of Christendom is being tortured. It's like they're in hell. They would stumble off cliffs and fall to their deaths. And that was something foreshadowed by the swine that... The, the, in fact, it was called the swine class. Um, and this was... I think this was from the Rainbow series. And that that's what was... Uh, that's what was, you know, foreshadowed by Jesus sending a legion into the herd of swine that stampeded off the cliff. And this was a real thing, because this was... And I, um... Anyway, what was I even talking about? I was at this library, and I wanted... I wanted to... I wanted to read an outside piece of literature written about Jehovah's Witnesses, because I wanted some... I, I was just something that I wanted. I wanted to understand... Because when I was at school, or anywhere I would go where I would say with Jehovah's Witness, people would say, what's a Jehovah's Witness? Or I'd say, well, Jehovah this, Jehovah that, and people would be like, what's a Jehovah? Um, and so I was trying to get, I was trying to get my mind around it. I was trying to um, do this independently, and I went to this library. Um, the only reference in this entire library filled with thousands and thousands and thousands of books. Amazingly, nobody had anything to say about Jehovah's Witnesses. There was no book. There was no book. Oh, excuse me. I, uh, uh, correction here. They had the truth book. They had the library stamp on it and everything. They had the truth book. And then they had a New World Translation Bible that were sitting on the shelves. Well, these are books that I already owned and have read and everything. But I, I wanted to see something written by an outsider. And uh, the, only, the only thing I could find about Jehovah's Witnesses was from an encyclopedia set that I was directed to. And it took me a great deal to find. So I went to this Encyclopedia Britannica. Went to uh, the... Uh, uh, article about Jehovah's Witnesses, and I read that Jehovah's Witnesses, based out of New York City, are a Protestant denomination. And that was the first time I had read that, and that was something a little bit shocking to me. They said they're a uh, Protestant domination of uh, um, restorationist origins, and it was, it, was, it was strange to me, but the entire article was about the corporate structure of Jehovah's Witnesses. And there was a little, there was a short paragraph about um, the, the, pre the, the preaching work and some of their um, non-traditional views. But it was basically two pages about the, uh, the, the office buildings uh, in, in New York and about the structure of how uh, the equivalent of, oh, well... <laughs> they have the way that they have bishops and deacons and in mainstream churches Jehovah's Witnesses have their own equivalent it's just different name they, they, their structure has their own unique names and it was very unfulfilling to me and I at, at a young age I and I got over it but I struggled with this idea that and it bothered me that people weren't paying attention to Jehovah's Witnesses especially since this was my whole life which had to do with my father. It was really hit my father. It was his whole life, every moment of every day. Jehovah, 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 and um, it and I followed suit, and it, it I I was a little Jehovah, <laughs> a little Jehovah soldier from a young age, and you know when I got older, got into the like the high school, junior high, high school environment. I start my world was getting bigger, and then Jehovah's world seemed like it was getting smaller. In the last days. Presumably, he says that the harvest is great and the workers are few. This is what bothered me more than anything. Now, I, I live in an agricultural environment, so I'm going to use this in, as an example. Well, what if what if you talk to a farmer and you said, well, let's talk about the harvest. 50% um, of it is just worthless. It's just going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, the farmer would tell you, that's a really bad harvest. It's not a great harvest. Well, it's worse than that. Uh, 90, like a, a big field of wheat or corn. You have a big field of wheat. 90% of it, unfortunately, can't be salvaged. It has to be destroyed. 
Well, that's not a great harvest. That's a terrible harvest. Well, it gets worse. 95% of the harvest has to be destroyed and burned with fire. Well, that's, that's a disastrous harvest. Well, it keeps getting worse. 99% of the crop has to be destroyed with fire, unfortunately. Well, that's not even a harvest. That's, it's, it, that's like the opposite of a harvest. That's a disaster. That's a waste of time. That's when you need to quit it. That's when you say this line of work isn't, isn't going to do it. You're faced with you're faced with the problem of okay did Jehovah did Jehovah not not you I, I guess this is a selective foreknowledge again is Je, was Jehovah exaggerating did he get people's hopes up Jesus did he choose his words incorrectly well he's done that before with the generations and some Jehovah's Witnesses do start thinking about things like this like just the mathematical aspects of it you do know the preaching works impossible right. I'm just talking mathematically. What Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to do by sending people two, two by two to each door, it's never, you, you do know it can't be done. It's not even in the ballpark and Jehovah's Witnesses will say, oh, Jehovah has a way. A few hundred people get baptized, a few thousand people, there's millions of people being born all the time. You'll never catch up. It's never going to work. Jehovah is losing. Well, you can't say that out loud at the Kingdom Hall, obviously, but when, you know, as a young person, those are things that cross my mind. I guess you push them out. Um, and that's, uh, presumably, that's what uh, my friend's relatives do here a little bit, too. Um, his his relatives seem like fairly thoughtful people, that these things have probably crossed their minds or occurred to them. And it's all, these are all coping mechanisms. Like, that's why this in letter was very interesting to me, because it reminds me of some of my own relatives, that they seem to have... This it's almost like they're it's like it's almost like they're crippled and they're and it's like they're crippling al along but they found something they can brace themselves <laughs> with or crutch, you know, and, and keep me moving towards that finish line. The finish line of Jehovah's Kingdom. That's what um a lot of Jehovah's Witness stuff is back back to basics. Like when things start getting confusing and, and just everything's all messed up in your mind, you just go back to basics and saying, Well, Jehovah, the paradise and just say, Well, we're getting so close to paradise, the new scrolls will open up. And uh, point number four, when I ask why Jesus said, those hearing my voice will not taste death, could they understand why others would interpret it differently since it uh, is clear, can Jay rightly kill people? Yes, he can kill you because you had the chance to get on the ark, bitch. No, I'm just kidding. Um, if you refuse to accept their view of anything, you will die. And that's, it's really black and white with Jehovah's Witnesses. It's an all or nothing proposition. You believe, you force yourself to believe 100% of everything that comes down the pipeline or you die. Um, they do not see the irony slash cruelty. Jay to them is a father that only kills some of his children. They could see that a human father that behaved the same way would be a monster, but couldn't apply that process to Jay, although Jay is better than human fathers. This is another point of dissonance that I also struggled with, and I think most people struggle, most Jehovah's Witnesses struggle with this at some point in their life, that the Bible says that God is greater than our own hearts, and yet God keeps doing things that you wouldn't do even on your worst day. Look, I really don't think you could have the Jehovah's Witness religion without the Jesus character because he kind of ties it all together. You know, he's he's like the mom of the family. <laughs> he really is. What? He, uh, and that is kind of, people pointed out that in, in some ways the Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't like the Trinity, but it is almost like a triune religion that there's Jehovah's the dad, Jesus is the mom, the governing body is the big brother and they're watching you. Well, um, uh, Jesus is, he, uh, when, when you read the greatest man book or the Bible passages and the scriptures, it's hard to correlate that with him killing people, just killing people wholesale. And we're not talking about like a sniper with a rifle <laughs> on a roof somewhere. We're talking about, he just like a volcano blowing shit up. 
Um, because the picture, look, the pictures in the magazines and in the books, it seems indiscriminate. The killing, and it's some, it's something that Jehovah's Witnesses struggle with a lot because you're saying, well, the really, really bad worldly people get killed just the same as the people that just didn't listen at the door. It's the same punishment. You could be a serial killer. You could kill a million people or you could just not pay attention to a Jehovah's Witness at, at the door. Jehovah, the punishment from Jesus and Jehovah is the same. A fiery death. Um, issue number five. Jay doesn't want to kill anyone. When I pointed out that he doesn't have to, he kind of does because they won't listen to him and he has no choice. Well, um, this is something This is something else that you, you may have, you know, <laughs> occurred to you. It's like, wait, Satan's world manages to keep society halfway safe. And they do that by locking up like one or two percent of the bad people. Have you ever, I mean, has this ever occurred to you that the Jehovah's Witness all in all, they say, well, they have to kill. He has to exterminate the earth because he has to save the chosen ones. And it's like, yeah, but the chosen ones are alive on earth right now and nobody's messing with them. Well, Satan will get involved later. And it's like, yeah, but you could just take Satan because it's Satan that instigates the killing of Jehovah's or the attempted murder of Jehovah's chosen ones at the end of the system of things. But if you just if you just snuffed out Satan right right now, which Jehovah could do in one second. Nobody in the world's going to mess with Jehovah's Witnesses because they're not puppets of Satan anymore. You take Satan out of the equation, people don't have to die. And in fact, things could largely continue. Look, you could put the Jehovah's Witnesses in charge if you're Jehovah. And the worldly people will fall on the line. They fall on the line with everyone else. Any other dictator that comes along, people... Look, if, if you're supernatural and you're Jehovah and you have, you know, all these visions and everything in the sky, people are going to fall to their knees and worship you. You know they are. And Jehovah's Witnesses know that too. The reason people aren't dropping to their knees and worshiping Jehovah is because nobody believes you. Give them a chance. Um, and the badness on this earth, the pollution, Jehovah can just stop it. Those bringing to ruin, those ruining the earth, look, people pollute. You don't got to kill them. Well, I'm not going to tell Jehovah what to do, but the thing is, if you want to stop pollution, you can do it. You don't got to kill everyone. That's what I'm saying. People break the law sometimes, you put them in jail. Five years later, they get out. I don't know. Well, yeah, you, you, you know what? Kill him. I. Why am I? Why am I trying to talk Jehovah out of killing people? Do it. I don't know them. <laughs> what am I? Uh, just whatever happens, it's okay. Who am I? I mean, here's what here's what I told somebody the other day. Somebody told me Jehovah doesn't exist. I'm saying, well, when did you decide this? And they're like, uh, huh, what? I said, what year were you born in? And they said, oh, uh, 1986? What year do you think Jehovah came into existence? Uh, and obviously this person has no understanding of Jehovah, has no fear of Jehovah, or doesn't even believe in Jehovah. But here's what he couldn't. Uh, answer for or explain. When did Jehovah come into existence? Can you tell me the year? How are you going to tell somebody that has existed successfully for thousands of years that they don't exist when you popped into a existence in 1986 and you can't even tell me how that happened? Jehovah, I'm, I've changed my mind. I, if you want to kill people, do it. I'm just getting this feeling that probably nothing's going to happen just because, well, there's been that track record there. And I know, I know Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jehovah likes that big entrance. He's like a magician. He wants to catch everyone by surprise. He wants to come as a thief in the night and just see that look on everyone's face when he fucks them over. And, 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 and I guess, I guess, but after a while you're like, wait, why would Jehovah and Jesus do that though? If they just want people to worship them and sanctify... Look, it's the easiest thing in the name. For, it's, the easiest, it, it's all about his name, right? His name, his name, his name, his name. And it's like, but wait. Jehovah's Witnesses are the ones spreading a false name. Isn't that worse? Because the worldly people aren't even doing anything. It's like, look, I didn't promote your name, but in all fairness, you didn't tell me what your name was. And then when you sent people to show up and tell me your name, it was the wrong one. 
And they went around giving people the wrong name. Why don't you kill them? Well, he might. He's crazy. <laughs> Anything could happen. Well, calm down. Nothing's going to... Nobody's gonna die. Um, but, uh... Um, the idea is that Jehovah doesn't want to kill anyone. He really doesn't want to. But for him, even though all things are possible with God, he couldn't figure out a way not to kill people. By the way, this guy solves really complicated problems and inventing the universe and creating all things. I'm imagining he had, he he came upon he came upon some uh, you know uh, problems here and there that he had to overcome, and amazingly he successfully. I mean, he he connected time and gravity together. He uh, he's the master worker, as Jesus said. I came to be a master worker beside you. But the two of them putting their heads together couldn't come up with a way not to kill, not to solve or problems without exterminating people. Well. Um, point number six, Jay allowed the bears to kill the children. Well, he's talking about the prophet, the prophet Elijah there. Uh, uh, Jay allowed the she bears to kill the children who insulted the prophet because, uh, the prophet was good. And so Jehovah, he, he well, the bears came out of nowhere. Here's an alternate theory. This is, and this is, uh, this is just, I'm just shooting from the hip here. He, the prophet killed them. The prophet killed uh, the little kids and tore them into 84 pieces or, <laughs> or whatever. And then after they were all killed and torn to pieces, he said, Oh, a bear killed them. Huh? How about that? I don't know. Does that sound like something that probably happened? Well, we'll leave it there. I'm just, I'm just taking a shot in the dark that he took an axe and chopped them all to pieces and then said, Oh, uh, pieces of bodies everywhere. Huh? Well, you gotta watch out for those bears these days. Uh, point number seven. When I asked if they would shed a tear when God kills me, one said yes and the other said no. But it was my choice to die. Point number eight. Jay may... Uh, this was, this was uh, a new thought for me. Jay might allow only one person into paradise. Huh. I had never, uh, you know, I had never gone down this pathway before, but I guess technically, if you think about it, um, because Jehovah doesn't have selective foreknowledge. Oh, it will, because of his, he select, he has selective knowledge about the future, and we are all masters of our own destiny a little bit. Sometimes we are, sometimes we aren't. But what if every Jehovah's Witness failed Jehovah except for one? Well, would Jehovah still have the trillions of year of paradise? Well, apparently so. What if after the thousand year reign, uh, everybody sided with Satan and uh, they all were destroyed with him when he appears from the abyss? Well, I guess it'll be Jehovah and Jesus and one person on earth. And that person is Tony Prime. <laughs> it didn't agree with their view that DFing can only happen if you're unrepentant. And this is key. You see, um, uh, this Robbie video that came out, it was very popular. People watched it and it was, it was hot stuff for about a week and then people uh, had a good laugh and forgot about it. I didn't forget about it. Well, anyway, there's this uh, young JW chap uh, named Robbie and he, um, he says that he went to a sandwich shop, got seduced by a woman, and she uh, basically man-raped him. He's a JW man baby and he's crying. He's crying to the elders and he's pleading and begging with them because he, he, wants to be, he wants to be a JW. He's not leaving for the world. He wants to stay at JW, but he knows he's really messed up and blown it. But he doesn't want to ruin his JW life. Doesn't want to lose his JW family. Doesn't want to have his JW world ruined. And so he's begging them not to disfellowship him. Well, and at first the elders think about it and they say, well, you know, Robbie, he's little Robbie from our congregation. And we've been his elders ever, probably ever since he was a little boy. We went fishing with him. We watched him grow up. But uh, in the end, the elders say, well, we can't let Robbie get away with it, though. 
We can't let Robbie think that he's going to get away with it, you see? And it would be wrong to let Robbie escape without getting what's coming to him. Robbie has to pay the price. And this is an instructional video showing, reminding elders that uh, all the little Robbies out there need to pay for failing. Um, to me, this is highly significant. And it was very, very, it was eyebrow raising for me because this, this is an actual practical demo and so they're kind of spiritually weak. Um, if you, if you were to become unevenly yoked with a person that's more spiritually weak than you, could that person drag you down? Do you think it's a danger for your family that they could be, unintentionally, but people in your group that you're trying to boost and support and encourage spiritually, that you could actually be bringing people down to the lowest level of the lowest person in the group? And... So, uh, the Watchtower study was disbanded, and, um, anyway, well, we've come a long way between then and now. Uh, we are now in the Happy at Bethel era, as you know, and I resisted it for, I resisted Happy at Bethel at first. I'm on board now, just so you know. I am, I lost. I tried to fight the war, I lost. So, Happy at Bethel wins, um... Issue number two, the elder training video. If you may remember it, it was something that was around uh, for a couple of weeks. It was the hot commodity, and then it disappeared pretty fast. <laughs> I'm still talking about it, though. Um, but anyway, uh, he, he uh, I guess, showed the elder training videos to his uh, JW family, and their uh, response was that it's obviously faked. It was not real. And uh, you see, his relatives are aware of the exclusive publications that the Watchtower Society makes books and videos, etc., and memos and letters that aren't to be seen by the congregation, specifically for the elders or exclusive people. And uh, consider that the elders leak who, the elders who leak these materials. It keeps happening again and again. Are snakes in the grass? They were not prepared to accept the Robbie video as real. So Issue number one being happy at Bethel. When speaking to his relatives, he found they were not interested. <laughs> in fact, as long as it wasn't in the Kingdom Hall itself, then he really didn't care. Well, that's reasonable. I mean, you wouldn't want to do something like that in the Kingdom Hall. We're just talking about Jehovah's House. Since the friends have had parties with non-Kingdom melodies uh, all the time, and so it seems uh, reasonable. Well... That's that that may that may seem really clucky to you, but I can imagine my own relatives re reasoning out the same uh, uh, thing. That the big thing all the time that my relatives say is, "Well, if the brothers say it's all right." They always refer to the brothers because the brothers convened uh, and decided that Happy at Bethel, it's pretty good. Yeah, we could do that in Jehovah's house. Sure. Well, um, I'm just remembering um, a little story here. Uh, I remember that in the 1990s, there was a book study group that um, started having refreshments after the book study. And this was not in the Kingdom Hall. This was when uh, the one-hour book studies on Tuesday nights were held in individuals' homes. People would have it in their living rooms of their house. There would be 20, 25 people there. And they started having, in their living room, enjoy Chex Mix and popcorn and study and have a group study of the Watchtower. And it got to be very popular to where it got, at first it was like 15, 20 people, got to be 25, 30. Uh, all the young people in the hall wanted to go there because it was this popular young couple. And they were very inclusive. They, did, they weren't shutting, it wasn't like a club where they were shutting people out. They they even they had people of a variety of ages 
there. Um, they even would wheel in an old person <laughs> to be included in it. Because you, you see things like that in the magazines. And so they wanted to have that kind of inclusive recreational thing that was also based in Jehovah. Well, the elders eventually put a stop to that as well. Because, um, and here's what the uh, head of the household, Timothy, told me happened. It was, uh, the elders met about it, and um, without telling these people. They didn't, they didn't tell this young couple that they were meeting about this. They just kind of heard and got the sense of what was going on. In fact, I think one of the elders even showed up for one of these uh, uh, Watchtower studies, and everyone was probably under the impression that he was having a good time too. But, in fact, he was gathering uh, info on what was going on there, and then the elders met uh, secretly or privately on their own time about it, and then informed uh, Timothy that the uh, Watchtower, the group Watchtower study would be discontinued because it was presented thusly. He said, Timothy, uh, you and your wife are spiritually advanced, and we commend you for that. Um, is everyone at the Watchtower study, at, would you say they're on the same spiritual level as you? Because uh, specifically, and they named names, so-and-so, and also uh, uh, so-and-so, um, do, they're, they're relatively new to the truth, aren't they? And then uh, a thing where after, after the book study, they would uh, play, play little games and the kids would play games and everyone would bring their friggin' marshmallow, uh, what is, what was that shit even called? What, the goop. Oh, it's some kind of jello with marshmallows. Well, you get the idea. And people would bring that and then they'd sit around with little dishes and eat it. Well... Um, the circuit overseer came along and put an end to it because, um, the, the book study is not a time for merriment, even though this was done after the book study was completed in the people's homes. The circuit, over the circuit overseer still, uh, felt he had the authority, and he certainly did, to end this practice because he felt that it could lead to people looking forward to the book study. <laughs> the people would be looking forward to the book study uh, for the purpose of enjoying the recreation and uh, uh, good feeling afterwards, which is not what they were trying to do there. Minor note, uh, some years later, they eventually had to cancel the book studies altogether. Jehovah had to cancel his plans to be having book studies because the, they couldn't get attendance above 50%. <laughs> so, Jehovah is... He's going to get people onto the ark, but he can't even get them into a Tuesday night book study. Well, um, I'm also um, remembering a uh, another uh, couple. It was a young couple um, that started having a watchtower study in their house. This was in the early 2000s. Um... And this was in preparation for the Sunday meeting, of course. On Friday evenings, they would have a, a group of people over to their home, and they would sit 